Hello, my name is Brenda Bailey Hughes and I welcome you to Cyber Focus, where today we'll be chatting with Matt Orego, uh, CEO and founder of Cornerstone Information Systems. Cornerstone is an application and data management company specializing in the travel industry. It's a recognized leader in the field. And Matt, well, Matt is an eclectic investor and board member with business interests in such varied companies as uh, professional sports, food manufacturing, even uh, auto dealerships, so a huge variety there. Matt lives here in Bloomington where we film the Cyber Focus series, and perhaps most important, he is one of our very own Kelly grads. So Matt, thank you so much for coming today. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Brenda. To Good to be here you. today. Glad you're here. Uh, let's start broadly. Tell me a little bit more about Cornerstone and some of its global experiences. Okay. Uh, as you said, Global uh, Cornerstone is you know, very much involved in, uh, in the travel industry. Um, we have been working in travel since uh, 1992, and specifically working in the area of automating the reservation process for uh, travel agencies and travel management companies, as well as online travel companies like Expedia and Orbitz and, and other such companies. We also work with corporations directly uh, in helping them manage uh, and procure uh, and better control the procurement process uh, of travel. So we work with very large Fortune 1000, Fortune 500 companies that spend a lot of money on travel. And so we provide a lot of data acquisition and data processing around that so that they can um, better purchase travel and better measure that and better work with suppliers and vendors in the travel space. Interesting. And so because, of, because it's a travel industry or because you're working with Fortune 1000s, how do you end up with so much global experience? Well, because the whole entire world is going global. Um, it is something that, um, you know, is, is very much uh, a part of so many companies uh, to have a, a global footprint and to be able to uh, travel anywhere and everywhere in the world. And so the logistics of that become very important. Uh, the data management and the data processing of that become very important. So as <clears throat> you know, the United States being one of the largest uh, travel markets uh, in, in the world, uh, here in the U.S. we spend close to $250 billion a year in travel. Oh okay, So it's a huge amount of money. And then outside the U.S. there is probably another $400 billion spent in business travel in particular, which is the area that we mm -hmm. that we focus in on. So as many of our large companies have, uh, have expanded all over the world, they want to have more of a uniform standardized process for, for purchasing travel. And so we have to go to all over, you know, all over the place really to secure data, to secure content, uh, to be able to capture reservation and information so that those companies can measure that and uh, negotiate properly with their suppliers on a global basis. Interesting. I know recently you've had some experiences in China, uh, yes. even connected to the Kelly School. Could you speak to those for a minute? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, recently went on a trip uh, with, uh, you know, with a bunch of uh, uh, academics from the uh, from not only the Kelly School but from uh, journalism uh, as part of a, uh, you know, trip that was there really, you know, to focus on. Um, entrepreneurship and small business uh, in China and to specifically learn you know about how that works in China and we it's part of a second part of a uh, of a um, of a, uh, uh, a conference that took place here in the US uh, where a lot of academics from universities there came here along with entrepreneurs and so it was a great way to uh, to go back to and go to China and and learn how small business works there what are the, the legal and um, and uh, policy uh, issues around small business and entrepreneurship in China. Does Cornerstone have quite a presence in China? We're starting to have a presence in China. As, what as was more, the as, impetus for the decision? Yeah, why, as, more, why you know, as, as more of our, you know, as more of our corporate customers have uh, focused their operations in China, um, then uh, we have to be there as well. And so, yeah. China is kind of a unique market. It's a little bit different than. Um, you know, than the European market, for example. Um, so? Well, it's different in the sense that, you know, it's much more closed, reservation processes and, you know, reservation systems that uh, many of the travel agencies and travel management companies use to secure travel uh, are a lot more closed in China. Well, okay? What does cl more closed, closed look like? Closed means mean? that, you know, that they don't, um, they're not global distribution systems per se that can be accessed, you know, from, um, you know, from anywhere in the world. 
Hmm. Right? So, you know, for example, here in the U.S., uh, there are basically three reservation systems. There's Sabre, uh, Amadeus, and Travelport, okay? And they're sold all over the world. Okay. okay. And so they have subscribers all over the world, both from travel agency perspective, tour operators, cruise companies. And so it is, you know, it's really a global marketplace, you know, yeah. where, you know, travel can be secured. Airlines, hotel, car reservations, so on and so forth. In China, there's one single um, uh, reservation system. Oh. And that reservation system only sells travel within the Chinese market. Okay. So when we have to work with corporations that have presence in China, we have to now have access to those systems to be able to then process those reservations and work with their local suppliers and bring that data back in so that it can be properly measured and accounted for. So how are you building the connection to have access to we're that just, one system? Yeah, we're just, you know, we're just starting those, uh, you know, we're just starting to explore those partnerships, okay? okay? And we're still, still, you know, we're just still starting to work with the travel management companies that work in those markets to do that. It's a very unique situation that, you know, uh, given time and as, and as China, you know, begins to open up their marketplace uh, and travel, you know, becomes something that uh, is is consumed, you know, from various sources, and there's more companies like an Expedia and like Travel, you know, and like uh, Orbitz and Travelocity there. Then the market will start expanding at that point too, mm -hmm. and then you'll have more access to information and more access to content that allows you and companies like ourselves, you know, to be able to develop applications and process for, uh, you know, for the customers that are e either we're serving directly here in, in the U.S. or in Europe, or hopefully soon companies that we're going to be servicing directly in China. Right. How has your approach changed in entering this market with its unique sort of closed nature, if you will? Well, it's it, it's it's a process of uh, you know, the way I you know, the way we've looked at it is um, you got to get to know the people that are there right now. You know, there has to be a lot of uh, of discovery, okay? Um, the best way to explain it is that you know there there really isn't a services or a technology services economy yet in in China. Mm -hmm. um, there aren't uh, technology services that uh, companies are are willing to purchase yet in China, and so it's a, it's a process of, of education where mm -hmm. um, you spend time with companies that are involved in the travel space in China and and you educate. Um, you, you compare and contrast, you know, you go in and you do presentations as to these are the things that we're doing in the U.S., these are the best practices of, uh, you know, of things that we're doing uh, and doing in Europe. And then you start figuring out, well, you know, what are the similarities, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and then you start seeing the opportunities to begin automating process. Much of what we do is about making the process of travel and the fulfillment of travel more productive, okay, and more efficient. And productivity is something that typically comes through some form of automation or improvement in workflow or whatever it might be. And so with China, I mean, the, you know, to do those things, you know, is, has been typically done by, by human labor. Mm -hmm. okay? And so it's really not that they need to be productive to, you know, reduce headcount. That's right. not necessarily, you know, what they need to be productive for. But they just really need to be productive because they're going to have to manage so much more uh, business travel. And so yeah. in, in China, you have today about $121 billion in business travel uh, on the, the aggregate, you know, within, within yeah. the Chinese market. It's predicted that in 2015, 16, it'll be about 250 billion. A good space for you to be A in. A good space for us to be in. Great. And compared to the U.S., which is right now at 260 billion, it's going to eclipse the U.S. in travel spend. So mm -hmm. it's not really the issue of productivity mm -hmm. to reduce headcount. It's the, just the ability to handle the amount of transactions right. that are going to be out there and the amount of work that's going to have to get wow. done. I, I know I find myself talking more and more to my students about intercultural communication and cultural mm -hmm. differences. You mentioned we go in, we do presentations that are... Um, for the purposes of education, that mm -hmm. that's that's and a feedback. Feedback. Yeah. Have you found that you or other reps from your company have changed your presentation, your education style to be in China, or is it pretty similar to what you would do in educating a U.S. company or a European country? Yeah, I mean, it is it is much more uh, the style of presentation is really much more about 
uh, about inquiring how they do things. Okay, mm -hmm. so, so you basically put ideas out there and then you ask a lot of questions. Um, you ask how they solve similar type of problems and the things that they're, you know, that they're doing. And there's, there's really a very, you know, very interesting uh, spirit of innovation in, in China. Um, that they want to do a lot of things uh, and they want to improve process and do things better. And so you really have to um, not be there to tell people necessarily how it is that they need to do things, but really to learn, mm -hmm. you know, uh, how they want to do things and where you see the opportunities potentially to insert yourself in there and help them, you know, in that process. How have you seen that, that spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation? Can you give me any examples of... Yeah, what I mean, brought you to that impression of the Chinese market? Yeah, I mean the you know the the very need to uh, to skip certain um, you know uh, process or, or or evolutionary steps. Let's say, um, you know, in in travel we had the phone right. that went to a browser that now is starting to play around with a mobile device. Okay. Okay. So now you can have a lot of travel content, travel reservations, uh, you know, on a mobile platform. Well. For them, they're they're skipping that entire process of of the you know of the browser and the desktop, Just jumping and right moving, to moving straight over to uh, working on interfaces and working on uh, you know on UIs and user interfaces that are more mobile enabled. Okay, and so they they look, they learn quickly, and then they innovate quickly, and so they don't necessarily follow the same progressions you know in an industry like travel that you know that we've seen in other parts of the world. Because you have seen that same evolutionary process yeah, in multiple I have. places, I and have. then boom, yeah, boom. Yeah, exactly. So, so you're seeing a lot of uh, of mobile-based applications out there. Um, you're seeing a lot of, of of small software development that's being done because of these you know mobile platforms, that you know that that is really being um, you know performed by very you know entrepreneurial um, you know young uh, mm -hmm. companies. You know, out there, and travel is a great place to play yeah. for them because it is something that is transactionally oriented. It's content oriented. It's something that you know is easy to present, you know, on a device, and potentially easy to transact. Hmm. Good. We have sort of two distinct audiences uh, for cyber focus. We we know that we have small business owners that mm -hmm. are watching, and we know that our own students are watching. So I'm, I'm looking for advice to either one of those groups. If, if we have students who are making curriculum and education decisions mm -hmm. as, a, as a Kelly grad yourself and, and still very involved as, as sponsor and, and traveler with, with mm -hmm. Indiana University, do you have advice for them? And then, of course, our small business owners, especially those who may be thinking of, of uh, a China entry or even just a, a global expansion for their mm -hmm. small business. What advice do you have for either of those groups? Well, you know, it's it's you know, read a lot, learn a lot, okay. uh, you know, before um, before you you know travel there. I mean, and, and, and traveling there. I mean, I, I went. This is my fifth time that I've been uh, you know to China. I went to the Olympics uh, a few years ago, and I think it's important, regardless of whether it's China or any other culture, it's really to understand uh, the culture first and understand the, understand the culture of the people there, um, and and how you know how those basic. Um, you know, values, you know, and, and processes work within, uh, you know, within that country. China in particular is, you know, is, has a lot of pride, has a lot of history. Right. Um, you know, you have to get to know um, the people there first. And, you know, and the relationships are, are very important to start with. Um, there's a certain formality, you know, uh, mm -hmm. to business in China. Um, but it's, it's one of, you know, I think respect Mm -hmm. You know, as you know, nice thing about business is that you know you can, you know, conduct yourself in a respectful manner and professional manner. Same thing in China, um, and you know, but it's really about understanding. It's really about uh, taking the time to learn. Um, I think sometimes the American style is is one of, you know, of, of telling our story first. Yeah. Uh, it's important to hear other people's, you know, story first and their impressions because they have impressions of, you know, of what it is you do potentially mm -hmm. and and it's a good thing to listen to those first and and then to take you know the the position that you want to take whether it's a position of I want you to represent my company or I want you to buy something mm -hmm. from me um, figure out unique ways to bring that together before you suppose or presume right and know. interesting that because you even mentioned that and in, in how did you change your presentations you said well 
we, we ask more questions, we get more feedback. Right. So that seems to be exactly. quite successful for you. Exactly. And, and then there's the informal. Um, you know, you, you know. Typically here, you know, in in the U.S., you schedule an appointment, you go to a presentation, you, you know, pull up the PowerPoint, and and away you go. Um, what's important is to is to you know, some of the most meaningful conversations I've had with business people and potential prospects there mm -hmm. and business partners uh, have taken place over dinners. Mm -hmm. uh, have taken place in a more social, you know, uh, ambience. If you go to a corp, you know, if you go to the headquarters of a company, there's a certain formality right. there that you have to present. And 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 in the U.S., I mean, it's become somewhat informal in many ways. I mean, there's this casualness here in the U.S. that you know, when you go to a U.S.-based company, I mean, you just have to put up tie. Right, and, right. You don't do that anymore. And there's a certain, you know, ease to doing business here. Um, over there, I mean, if you're going to go to a company and if you're going to go to their office, then it, it is very formal. Okay, mm -hmm. and and they're going to put up their they're going to put their most formal presentation forward, forward, and you have to do the same thing. So take the time to, you know, to find ways to interact in more informal mm -hmm. uh, manners. Meet for breakfast, for example. Great. Um, invite them to lunch. And you initiate these informal gatherings. Yes, you it, feel it, comfortable exactly, doing that with exactly. prospective co clients. Exactly. And, and those are things that I learned along the way too. That you know, you just. Yeah, it's the same thing here. You you have, you know, you have that opportunity to to really get to know somebody outside the office, mm -hmm. and that's a, even more important, I think, if you really want to get to know someone and and do business with them. Great advice. Good. Anything else you want to share with students or small business owners about global experiences? You certainly have a wealth of global <laughs> experience. It's you know, it, you know the. Uh, the world, you know, I, I, I talk about our global experience, international experience. You know, I have my domestic markets, and then I have my, you know, my, my non-domestic markets. Right. Um, Europe is turning to be a, out to be a domestic market for what, me. How does, what does that mean? Well, because it's become domesticated. <laughs> you, know? <Okay. laughs> you know, it's something that's just become part of, you know, of, of how we do business, you know, um, you know, it, it is. It's no longer exotic or it's, new it's no, or it, well, foreign. It's, yeah, I mean, there's parts of it that are, of course, and, you know, there's different languages and mm -hmm. all those wonderful things that you experience. But 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 it becomes part of, of habit and of process, mm -hmm. you know, at that point. And, and what I'm noticing is that the world is very much like that now, is that it's just becoming much smaller. And so what what is, you know, what, what becomes domestic in many ways doesn't necessarily have to be confined to, you know, the U.S. Yeah. You know, it, it can be, um, you know, it can be Europe, it can be the U.K. Uh, and, and those are becoming our domestic markets, you wow. know. And, and so the, it's, you have to work, you know, at making the world, you know, as much of your home base as possible. Hmm. Thank you. This is Cyber Focus. We're here with Matt Arego, who reminds us that we need to make the world our home market. Thank you.